You're listening to Product-Led Revenue, brought to you by Correlated. In each episode, you'll hear first-hand advice and tactics from SaaS sales and revenue leaders about using product signals to drive expansion and revenue growth. Let's jump in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Product-Led Revenue. I'm Breezy Beaumont, and this episode is brought to you by Correlated, a customer expansion platform for B2B tech companies that focus on product-led growth. Today, our guest is Moritz Plasnig, Chief Growth Officer at Immuta. Mo, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, so to give our audience some background on yourself, can you tell us about your role at Immuta? Yes, so I joined Immuta five months ago, roughly. I run everything, product, engineering, and also marketing, um, and we call all of that growth, which is sometimes a little bit confusing, but I think um, it captures well how um, I think the world is changing and product and marketing is um, overlapping quite a bit, especially with product led growth. So um, we, we put it together, which is, I think, very, very good. Awesome. And so for anyone listening who maybe doesn't know what a mute is yet, do you mind giving a little bit of background on the problem that you're helping to solve there? Sure. So what we do in a nutshell is um, cloud data access control. And, and what that means is, um, so imagine you are a large bank, financial institution or healthcare company. Um, you obviously, by definition, right, you have a lot of sensitive data and sensitive data could mean you have like credit card numbers, um, bank account details, social security numbers and all of that. Right. And so um, you have all of the data and um, certain people in your organization need to access the data, but not everybody is allowed to access all the data. Right. There are, there's a lot of regulation um, in place. There, there, is, um, there are many internal policies you have to adhere to. So um, we help uh, make sure that the right people can access the data and that the right people can also access the data um, whenever they need to. So in the, in the old world, um, you usually hard coded a lot of rules into your data store and your database or data warehouse. Um, and then whenever somebody um, wanted to access some data, they maybe sent an email or opened the ticket and then it took quite some time and days and weeks to, to get back to the person with that data. And then in the meantime, the data changed. And so we automate all of that. Um, we basically automatically um, apply those policies to all the data stores um, across all the data stores and your data consumers and analysts, for example, automatically has access to the data they need, um, which is um, unlocking a lot of the value of the data you have. Awesome. Um, and so I'm going to work a bit backwards here, but you also started your own company, Codeship, uh, which you eventually sold yeah. in 2018 to Cloud bees, uh, <laughs> not to give away the ending of the story, but can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about that company and uh, how you're finding upsell and expansion opportunities um, over there? Yeah, so um, the company I started with the co-founders, um, Coachup was a developer tool um, and it was completely um, like bottom up. Um, it was a bottom up model. So, um, I started a company in 2010, um, quite some time ago, um, and it was a SaaS product from day one. We just put it online, um, got our first couple of customers, eventually raised money and got more customers and all of that. But it was always like product like growth, just that nobody uh, called it product like growth um, back then. And um, fast forward, I think 2018, we sold the company. At that point, we had like um, a couple of thousand customers. And then a CloudBiz, the company that acquired us, um, I think they were a much more established, larger company um, that had a more traditional enterprise sales model. So through that transition and acquisition and integration, um, I, I started to understand the other side. So I, I always say I grew up in this product-led, um, bottom-up world, um, never truly understood enterprise sales. Um, at CloudBase, I um, learned enterprise sales and started to understand how to do like large seven-figure type transaction, what it takes to do those transactions. Um, but then I also learned um, to navigate like this this tricky path from well, how do you as an enterprise software vendor, um, how do you evolve, right? And how do you um, when you're already selling those large transactions, how do you actually move down market and start to um, sell more SaaS products and and start to get into this product that. Um, for all, it's, it's really, really hard because all the incentives work against you, right? If you're moving up market, 
um, you see larger and larger deals, which is great, right? And you get really excited and you do your first like five figure, six figure, seven figure deal um, and you get rewarded um, as a company when you do that. But if you do the opposite and you move down market, the opposite is the case, right? Your deals are suddenly smaller and smaller and smaller, um, but they're also often quite some work. So it's really hard to do that and not many companies did that well. Um, so spent a couple of years at CloudBiz uh, working with them for that transition and um, now at Immuta trying to basically apply all those learnings and do it well and learn from all the mistakes I made in the past. So what was that, what was that moment like I think a common question people have when they think about because you know nowadays this product led growth movement um, a lot of companies want to you know start their company in that way or they're moving their company in that direction but when did you think it was the right time for you all to sort of build sales on top of your your product led uh, movement that you already had going yeah it's um it's interesting so now looking back with like having seen it done in different ways and having a little bit of perspective. I think when we started coaching, when we were all, I think, quite inexperienced and young, and uh, I think we just thought like, this is how you should build a product, right? It was always clear to us, well, if, if we use products, right, we want those products to be really, really good, right? Have a great um, end user experience. And then if I try out a product, I want to be able to right, try it without talking to anybody, especially as a developer. Um, and then I want to buy, right? Just put in my credit card. So for us, it was always like, well, that's just how it should be. <laughs> um, and then I think over time, we started to realize, well, um, we are getting those larger companies, right? Where maybe a large like public company started to use CodeChip and it was one team using CodeChip and then two teams and then three teams. And then they suddenly wanted to talk to us. We, we like had to figure out how to how to make that happen because we just didn't have any experience with that and so i think our customers eventually like um kind of forced us to do sales um and i think how we started doing it we first started doing customer success in a better way right we started or maybe to take a step back, right? We started doing customer success, but just answering support tickets, right? We help customers whenever they had issues. And then we started to do customer success in terms of, well, we have those customers that are using the product more and more. So let's have a conversation with them about like maybe going from a monthly to an annual plan, or let's figure out how we can get more teams inside the larger organization to use CodeChip. Um, we'll also sell more expensive pricing plans um, and subscriptions to them because we can see in their usage data that um, they would actually benefit from upgrading because um, then in our case, the developer productivity would increase. So that is how we started. Um, and then um, once that worked well, I think we started doing that when we had probably several hundred customers. And then I think when we crossed a thousand customers, uh, customers in our case meant like companies, um, I think when it crossed a thousand customers, we then started to do more actual sales where we also started to experiment. Well, you get all those inbound leads, right? People signing up for the products, trying it. Um, and um, what if we start talking to those as well, right? So I feel like our customers um, pushed us in that direction um, because larger and larger companies tried out the product and they had a certain expectation um, that there is somebody on the other side that talks to them and maybe does a demo or answers certain security related questions. And so I think our customers um, were the primary reason why we started doing sales. Got it. And did your sales team have access to, um, you know, some of that data around how people were using the product um, to find those upsell or expansion opportunities? Was there access to that data and, and how did that work? Yeah, so I think in the beginning, um, I think they always had access, but in the beginning it was quite basic, right? We maybe had like um, a dashboard somewhere, or we, we built like our own internal admin portal um, um, that employees could access and could see and look up like, okay, here's a specific account, customer account. Um, how are they using the product? How much are they using it? And, and, and all of that. So I think that is how it started. And then we hired I think we had the first, our first salesperson, then we had two, then we had four, then we had eight, right? And so um, when you go for the transition at some point, you're like, well, we have to kind of like productize that or like build a process around it, right? It can't just be, oh, there's this internal um, 
website where you can look things up um, that just didn't scale. And I think at that time, we also started to use Salesforce more and more because um, Salesforce, I, I think even today is still the standard uh, and every salesperson knows it. So there's a lot of, right, I think um, everybody's incentivized to kind of go with Salesforce because every salesperson just knows it and it's easy for them to get started. Um, but then the, the problem we experienced here is, well, how do we expose all the product data in the tool the sales team is using, which is Salesforce. And so that um, then led us down the route of building a custom Salesforce integration and like pushing certain product data into Salesforce. And that was all like, I don't know, six years ago or, or something like that. So I think back then the tooling wasn't really great. And so we had to build a custom integration and it helped the sales team a lot and it unlocked more sales because they could really leverage the product data. So it was super helpful. But um, all I remember from the time is it was extremely cumbersome to build that integration, right? And we had like engineers building that integration <laughs> instead of engineers building capabilities and features that create more value for the customer. Um, and then a concept that broke and Salesforce data model didn't work that well. I think there's a lot to learn from that. Um, I think it was quite painful, but we had to do it to keep growing. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, obviously, so correlated helps to, to solve that problem, right? But that's that's something that we experienced yeah. ourselves at multiple companies. That's something that we talk to companies who are still today. Um, obviously, there's there's many out there who are still, uh, you know, trying to use Salesforce or, or HubSpot CRM in this sort of dynamic way. And mm -hmm. it does, it just requires so much um, customization. Uh, but, you know, I, I still always think it's impressive for the teams who were able to build it out functioning enough to uh, to make it work for them, because it, it definitely uh, is it's a big undertaking to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, right, just to, I think, put things in perspective. I think we were like, when we, when we saw Coach, we were like 30, 35 people, but they had a full-time person um, that did nothing else than maintaining Salesforce among a couple of other things, right? But they just chose Right, and you have to invest quite heavily um, very early on um, in an area where you just don't expect that as a founder, right? You think, okay, we, we need engineers to build product, right? And then we do marketing and then we hire salespeople and then you suddenly realize, oh shit, um, making all of that work requires quite some behind the scenes work. Um, and there wasn't a good answer back then. I know now, now there is luckily. So, <laughs> um, um, but back then it was really, really painful. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I could see that. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, I've heard it. I spoke to, um, the team over at attentive and they recently had acquired privy. Um, and so privy is obviously a, a, a PLG motion type of company. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being on the other side of that transaction, being acquired by, uh, you know, being a product led company that was acquired by a sales led company. What was that transition like um, for for you all internally? Yeah, I think it was um, painful. <laughs> uh, that's probably the best way to describe it. And I, I, I think we, we expected it, but then you just don't really know how painful it will be until you go through it. And I think the, the root cause for the pain is going back to what I said earlier, right? The incentives are just really, really screwed, right? If you are um, a bottom up company, right? You're incentivized over time to move up market um, because that means you make more money, um, right? And I remember a coach chip, right? We had all those like small monthly subscriptions and um, that like, I think we didn't fully appreciate how, how awesome that actually was back then we always wanted larger deals um and larger deals meant more work um but it also meant more money right so that's great and then at cloud i think um educating everybody there on right how to basically make the opposite happen right you need to move down market and disrupt um yourself a little bit um and although you're already able to sell those large enterprise-wide deals right to fortune 500 fortune 100 companies you now need to start like moving down market i think that's just it's hard to wrap your head around um because all you get in return is lots of small customers um that are a lot of work but they aren't paying a lot um and all your internal processes aren't set up for that right um, because all your internal processes are set up for those large transactions where it's totally okay if you throw people at a problem, right? And you're hands-on, but then if you compare 
the typical bottom-up company with a um, enterprise sales company, right? Um, the approach we always took at Coachable was, well, we need to automate as much as possible uh, because how could we otherwise, right? With 30 people deal with thousands of customers. So it's just such a different culture and mindset um, that it's really hard, I think, to merge and, and, and bring together. Uh, so we tried, I think, really, really hard um, and we all knew what the obstacles are and we were mindful of those, but it's still, it's still hard. And I think we could have done many, many things better. Um, that being said, I think there are very few companies that really did it well. I think the one role model we always used and looked at um, was MongoDB, and I can't think of many others. Um, and, and I think what MongoDB did well is, right, they, um, I, I looked at the numbers um, and I, I was just like blown away because they basically, right, they, they went public as a like um, enterprise sales company, right? They had open source and then they sold packaged software. Um, and when they went public, I think 1% of their revenue was SaaS. And then um, over time, and if you look at the numbers now, right, more than 50% of their revenue is SaaS and they really um, completely reinvented um, themselves. And that's why they're I think, doing quite well. Um, so I think you also need to have those role models where you can see somebody else did it and here are all the lessons you can learn from that um, to make it happen. Because again, your incentives are just screwed. Um, so it's hard to hard to, uh, I think, stay focused and, and keep doing it. Yeah, and, and one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have um, is, you know, you either need to be product led or have a sales team, right? And we've been talking about this topic, obviously, you had both. But yeah. what, do you, what do you say to people who kind of feel like it's this or that? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's bullshit, um, right? I mean, there's just, I think so much, I think suddenly everybody talks about product-led growth um, and right, there are lots of people who want to be thought leaders in that space. There are a lot of investors who are suddenly really smart about it. Um, and when I look back, I think 10 years ago, right, there were plenty of companies that were already doing it, but nobody realized yet that it's a great model. And then the first set of companies went public in that space, right, with such a model. And then everybody was like, Oh shit, right? It's like lower, right? CAC and like um, really great growth and high net dollar retention rate, right? There are all those advantages. And now everybody think looks at it and tries to pick work from there and, and think through, okay, how can I also get those results? And and now I think PLG is like really, really overhyped. Um, I think as a as a founder or if you are right in a in a company that is thinking about um well what model works best for us, I think it really it really depends on what your product and market is, right? Um, to give an extreme example, because um, at Immuter, right, we do a lot of business with the government. Our founders worked um, in, in, the, in the intelligence community. So um, we have that background. And when you, when you sell to the government, right, it's not that a government agency, right, it's just like randomly trying out a SaaS product on the internet. And then there are a few people who put in the credit card, <laughs> right, um, and then expand it and start um, um, using it, right? That's just not how that um, market segment operates, right? So in that world, um, it's probably highly unlikely that you do product-led um, today. But then if you build a, um, a developer tool and it can easily be used and adopted by teams and creates a lot of value in for a single team, right? That's obviously the perfect model for, for BLG, right? So I think um, as a founder or as an exec or, or a person who works for a company trying to think that through, right? You have to ask yourself, well, what's our market, right? What's the problem we're solving? What's the value we create? Who are we selling to? Um, who is our customer? And then think through, okay, for that product in this specific market, what's the best model to grow? And what's maybe the best model today? And then maybe the different model um, works better tomorrow, right? So I think you have to be smart about it. Um, it doesn't work for every problem, every market. Um, and then I think um, in, if you believe um, product like growth is the right model, um, I think what you will learn over time is, well, there is a huge advantage if you um, marry that model with a more traditional sales model, right? And there's a there's a playbook that many companies adopted where maybe, right, you get your first set of customers just through BLG and people put in a credit card and then you start adding customer success and you do more upselling and then you start adding an inside sales team, right, that sells smaller deals, but it's already sales assisted. Um, and then maybe you had an enterprise sales team eventually. I think there's a clear 
um, playbook around that. And if you apply it well, you will do really, really well because you can see those small deals, right? You have that long tail of small customers and you get like tens and then hundreds of customers every month. But then you're also able to grow those like six, seven figure accounts because you know how to deal with them. And I think like, I don't know, five, in five years or in 10 years, I assume most B2B companies will simply do both, right? And we will probably not talk that much about it anymore because that's then just the model, right? And there's something new um, that everybody talks about. I, uh, I think it just makes sense, right, that you do both because I think all the companies that, that don't excel in both um, won't be around if their market requires them to excel in both. Yeah, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And let's jump over to Amuta now. So you guys are over 200 people at this point. Um, you originally started as a sales led company and now you're more product led. Uh, so tell me about that yeah. transition. And I'm also really curious to hear about how your your team is set up over there with you know customer success and sales and all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I think going back to what I um, talked about earlier, right? I think. Um, Immuta, because of the founding history and the founders um, work for the U.S. government, right, um, being really familiar with that um, market and, and those type of customers, right, that is where we started. Um, because of what we are doing, right, we deal with sensitive data, we create a lot of value for companies that have a lot of sensitive data and are adhering or have to adhere to a lot of um, regulations, right? I think by definition, that means we do well in certain industry verticals, right? In our case, financial services, healthcare, et cetera. And so I think that by definition, then again, means that um, having a more sales-led model to get started was the right decision, right? Because I think we would have not gotten our first government customers with a product-led model. So that's just the founding history. And so what made sense? But then now that we are getting bigger, right? And we raise more money and we are more people and we're seeing a lot of commercial success, right? Now, um, um, we, we also see a lot of interest from like smaller companies and for example, a fintech or health tech, right? That um, are first and foremost technology companies, um, but they are still right operating in a regulated industry. So they have to adhere to a lot of regulations, have a lot of sensitive data. So I think those type of companies, um, the big difference between those fintechs, right? And the, let's say more established uh, bank is that fintechs are still tech companies, right? So they have certain expectations when it comes to products, right? They prefer SaaS over everything else, right? Because they don't want to deal with the overhead of running software. Um, they have a really high bar when it comes to like product experience, right? And end user experience, right? So I think um, um, with, with, with us seeing demand from that market segment, um, we believe it's right the right choice to try to move right a little bit down market, um, double down on SaaS, build a product that eventually can be fully adopted without talking to us. But for us, it's a it's a journey. So we launched our SaaS back in June in private preview, which just I think two weeks ago, um, we announced our SaaS is now a public preview and we will launch it in, in, into general availability soon. So we are in this journey. Um, and so we are, we are basically looking at everything we are doing in terms of right, the processes, um, and we are thinking about, well, how do we need to evolve and reinvent ourselves to deal with that new market and this new opportunity um, while still being able to serve our existing customers, right? And get more of those because we, we do quite well there. And so um, we are in by right, trying to do what's hard, which is moving down market um, to a certain degree. But I think um, because we are mindful about it and we are fully committed to it, I think it will uh, work and we can see those early proof points where we're getting more and more SaaS customers, right? And we see much more velocity there. So um, I think you just have to be mindful um, and then get the get the team focused and aligned and, and get everybody to understand, well, this is different. And so uh, everything we learn and everything that got us to where we are, all those learnings, right? All that experience might not be the right experience for what we have to do going forward. <laughs> um, and uh, I think so far, when I look at the last couple of months, I think we have we have we have done a good job. Um, so, to maybe go into right some of the learnings, I think what really helps us is that. Um, the way how we structure the org, where we have with sales, with customer success, and then we have what we call growth, where we basically aligned everything product, right? So engineering, product management with everything marketing. Uh, and it's all one big organization, which I think just 
helps and is tremendously powerful for for building a product led business because when you uh, try to build a product right where you want the customer to be able to just go to the website adopt it try it purchase it without talking to you as a company right i think the the two functional areas that impact that the most is i mean obviously product right because the product needs to support it and needs to be good enough and simple enough and all of that but then the customer experience starts on the website right and you might land on a blog post or you might um, i don't know see an ad online or you might land on the documentation for a google search right you land somewhere and it is where the customer journey starts and so i think aligning product and marketing around that um um, goal of making sure that the customer from wherever they land in terms of marketing assets then gets into a product that's a seamless experience and becomes successful there. I think that alignment is absolutely critical. Um, and then there's a lot you need to do with customer success and sales. So happy to talk about that, that as well, if it's helpful. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I think thinking about a sales team uh, and customer success, but especially sales team moving, uh, moving with you as the company transitions. I'm sure. I'm sure that requires some, you know, retraining yeah. to maybe more of a consultative sales role. And yeah, I'd be curious for you to jump in there as well. Yeah. So I think right again, it's like it's a big change. So I think with with everything that's like just like whenever you try to lead a team through a big right change i think it always comes down to you need to evolve your processes people need to evolve right culture needs to evolve so you have to be mindful of all of that um when i look at sales right and i think that the problem with sales in this new world is that the incentives are just completely screwed right if you are an enterprise sales rep you're used to doing like six seven eight figure transactions right you have a huge quota um what you're obviously focused on is those large deals, right? Because you do the math. How do I right, outperform my quota and make a lot of money? It's, well, I need to sell several larger deals, right? That's the path, right? You don't um, look at it where you're like, okay, I could sell like 150 <laughs> small product-led deals, right? Where, where I play a role, right? It's just um, not the mindset um, of, of those people, right? So you need to incentivize people to focus on the smaller deals because otherwise um, I think nobody will do it um, and, and for a very good reason. So we put a lot of work, although our SaaS is not even in GA yet, we put already a lot of work into um, putting the right incentives in place so that everybody at the company that is selling is incentivized to sell smaller deals um, because for us as a company it's it's totally worth it and we know there will be a lot of expansion that comes from the smaller deals so that's one i think the, the second one is um you need to enable the company on on that new motion right and train people over and over and over again um, because it's different right it's different from what worked in the past so you need to go above and beyond uh, in, in terms of enablement and, and helping people to understand. So that's, I think, the, the people, culture um, element of it. I think in terms of processes and tooling, uh, I think a lot also has to change. I think you're still in that transition where, again, right, we use Salesforce uh, because that's the tool we, we started using when we started doing sales, uh, which is not surprising. And so the question for us is, I think right now we work and around the tool, right? We have a data warehouse, Snowflake in our case, we have Looker. Uh, and so we are we are providing a lot of insights into those uh, SaaS accounts and SaaS customers through Looker dashboards and, 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 and other ways. But we know that's right, once we start scaling um, and, and once we get more and more customers, that's probably not the right tooling. Uh, so we need to think through how to evolve our tooling as well. But for me, that's, um, as much as I like to think about tools and products, right, that, it, that are in that space, to be honest, it comes second for me because you can change tools um, quite easily, uh, actually, as long as the team is aligned, right, and the culture is there um, and, and everybody is, is ready for the change. So that is why we focused on the culture change and the enablement and the incentive piece first, and then tooling comes second. So. Um, in terms of customer success, uh, so that I don't forget about customer success, I think customer success is actually easier. I mean, it depends on how you define customer success um, at your company, right? Um, I think that the big, I think 
difference can be that in, in, in some companies, customer success owns, for example, renewals, owns upsell to a certain degree or fully. In other companies, they don't. In our case, sales is fully responsible for that. So I think customer success is really focused on uh, making sure the customers get value out of the product and are really successful. And that then unlocks upsell, cross-sell and all of that. Uh, and so I think if that's the main goal of the customer success team, I think they are always appreciating if you do more product-led growth stuff, right? Because what it means is a better product experience, which means happier customers, happier end users, right? Easier to use product. Um, the more you do SaaS, the more data you have about how customers are using the product, right? The easier it is to reproduce bugs, issues, the easier it is to help customers. So I think customer success is actually the easier functional area in that transition to deal with um, because uh, they get so much good out of it. I think it's harder with sales because incentives, as I said, are just screwed. Yeah, what are some of the incentives that that you're all testing right now to, to you know, help to align? Yeah. So yeah, incentives are the way to align your sales team in the right direction. So it's like, what are some of the incentives that, that you found, yeah. you know, maybe working so far? What are you planning on? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, with right with sales teams, right, you can do spiffs, right? Um, spiffs can mean, right, if you sell a SaaS deal, you get a certain amount of money, right? Um, if you source a SaaS opportunity, right, that's worth a certain amount of money, right? Those are the easy ones. Um, um, I think another um, lever you can pull is you simply pay more for every dollar of SaaS revenue uh, that comes uh, into the company, right? So if you sell traditional on-prem package software, um, you get X, but if you sell SaaS, you get X2, right? Something like that. Um, uh, because that then the deals are still smaller, right? But what the deals mean for the rep in terms of their compensation, you make them artificially bigger um, to incentivize them selling uh, those deals. So I think that's, yeah, right? Uh, I think straightforward, if you're really committed to it, you just have to spend the money um, and you have to spend it. And that then unlocks all the good things that happen once you get more more of those customers, right? Because expansion happens faster and more naturally and all of that. Um, so you just have to spend um, before you see the the, the positive, right? Um, and the, the positive things happening and the metrics go up. I think another, we are not doing it, but um, what you could also do is you can, and other companies have done it, and I've seen it in the past, right? You could build an overlay model where you have specific people selling SaaS. And that goes right back to your point around, right? The sales approach changes a little bit. And um, right, if you have people going into the product, they're trying it, right? You, you evolve from having NQLs to like PQLs and all of that. Um, I think in that world where you where you where you see that go really well, I think then it makes sense to build an overlay sales model where you have specific people who understand how to work with BQLs, right? Where you might, depending on the the, the market you're in, right? If you are selling right data engineering tools or developer tools, right, you might actually have more technical people in those roles uh, because. The people who try out the product, they right, primarily have more product-related questions in the beginning. So I think that overlay model might make a ton of sense um, for you as well. It just depends on um, how you're going through that transition. Um, so again, right, there's a set of tactics that you have to decide well, but which ones make the most sense. I think incentivizing sales team and paying more on those smaller deals, I think, uh, is a no-brainer that you need to do. Definitely. Yeah, I was listening to um, Mark Roberge a couple of weeks ago uh, out at the Saster conference, and he was talking about changing uh, their incentives for the sales team also when, when he was over at HubSpot to being more mm -hmm. on the expansion side than the initial land. So yeah. focusing on the expand rather than just the land so that you know, then the team understands that just getting that foot in the door and then yeah. you can you can find all those expansion opportunities over time. Um, so then they they actually were saying to their sales team, you know, instead of paying you, you know, X percentage of the land, we'll pay you, you know, 4X that in the expand. And, <laughs> and yeah. it worked for them, I guess. So it was interesting. Yeah, that's a, I think it's a good point because I think what it also shows is it really depends on 
were, what's your starting point, right? I think HubSpot as an example, HubSpot, I think was, at least it's my impression was never an enterprise sales vendor, right? They were always, right? I mean, HubSpot built the whole business around, well, we are the, the content marketing company, right? And then they had an inside sales team uh, that did high velocity deals. So I think if you are doing that, right, I think um, if you're already having this more high velocity go to market model, it's great because you're already right halfway <laughs> there uh, because uh, high velocity sales is already closer to product led than enterprise, right? If you're, if you're doing the traditional enterprise sales, right, do a proof of concept, proof of value, um, and then, right, we work with you and you try the product for a while and then we sell those large deals, right? That's, that's I think, as far away from um, product-led as you can go. So if you start there, I think the tactics you need to apply are different than if you start with something that's much closer, which I think is this like HubSpot high velocity inside sales type model. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one thing I want to jump into here as well is your your tech stack over there at Amita. So I heard you mention uh, Snowflake, I think, High Touch, Looker, uh, mm -hmm. and Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? What else are you? What else do you have in the tech stack? And and how are you sort of making that work so that your team can use these product insights to to take action? Yeah, I think the other, I mean, you also use DBT, right? That's, I think, a, another common, right, dual in this, like, modern data stack. So, and then we use Imuta <laughs> um, as well, right? Um, but I think the important pieces are, I think, the shift that's happening in our industry is, right, I think we now have really good cloud data warehouses, and that unlocks a lot. So we use Snowflake because we believe the cloud data warehouse should be the single source of truth. Um, and when I look back to how we did things at CodeShip, right, five, 10 years ago, to how we do things now at Immuta, um, I think the cloud data warehouses are such a game changer because suddenly there is, there is this product, right, <laughs> where you can store all the data and it supports that versus what we tried to do at CodeShip is we, I think, misused Salesforce a little bit for that. Um, and that just didn't work at scale. So I think um, Snowflake is awesome. Snowflake is the single source of truth for us. And then what I think happened in this whole ecosystem is once Snowflake started to get a lot of momentum and people started to adopt it a lot, there are now a lot of interesting smaller companies in the ecosystem getting built. And one of them is High Dutch. And so what High Dutch enables us to do is, right, I mentioned this like custom built, homegrown, um, product data to Salesforce sync that we built at CodeShip. Um, that took a lot of time, right? We had engineers build it internally. We then use contractors, right? You need people that know Salesforce, Salesforce API. Uh, I think we used, we purchased some sort of product additionally there. It was just a mess, right? It cost us a lot of money, overhead, um, and all that effort should have been spent on just improving our core product and make our customers more successful. And now with High Dutch, Right, Hydrage just does it out of the box because what Hydrage does is we have all the data in sales uh, in, in, in Snowflake, not in Salesforce. <laughs> uh, we have all the data in Snowflake, right? And then Hydrage allows us to basically take data out of Snowflake uh, and then sync it into different business tools, and that's extremely powerful because I think even in this new world with product like Grove, I think at least for the for a while, right, there are those well established tools in certain functional areas, right? Could be Salesforce for sales, could be, right, Bartel, Marketo, et cetera, HubSpot, like for email marketing, Sendesk for support, right? Whatever your tool stick is, gain set for customer success, right? You have all those well-established tools. So you somehow need to get the data out of your data warehouse into those tools, uh, because otherwise you can't leverage, right? All this, all the product data, all the usage data. And so that is what we're using Hydrage for. And that basically, right, by us purchasing this one tool and writing a simple SQL query and say, okay, with this SQL query, take data from Snowflake and put it into Salesforce, we suddenly replace this mess of a custom built um, Salesforce sync. Um, so that, that that's, I think, um, the biggest game changer for us. I think, um, the the problem i know we will face in the near future is that all those looker dashboards to 
um, give our customer success team or our sales team insights into specific customers, that approach isn't scaling, right? I think Looker is a great product. It works well for us, but it specializes in, I think, showing aggregated views, right? Hey, here is how much ARR we have as a company or in a certain segment and how it grew over time. Uh, but what we need, and that's a missing piece in our puzzle today is we need to somehow give our customer success and sales team a tool where they can really see um, what's going on with specific customers and zoom in. Um, and ideally that tool is primarily powered again by the data warehouse. Um, and then we push data via high touch into, into that tool. So I think that's the next um, tool that we need to adopt to make teams here more successful. And then I think the other problem that we will face after that is, again, with once we once we get to a larger scale, the, the problem that we weren't able to solve a code chip at all was um, once you start to merge this bottom up model with a sales model, uh, right, you have a lot of product notifications and outreach built into the product, right? Like could be during the onboarding, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z as a next step. Could be, oh, you aren't using this feature at all. Here is why you should and the value it unlocks. Or it could be, hey, we are seeing you are getting close to your, um, um, to the, the, the limit, right? In terms of your pricing plan and subscription, right? You should upgrade, right? Um, all those things you often built into the product or you use specific products, right? To trigger all that outreach. Um, and then when you do sales, you have all the sales tools, right? It could be as simple as, well, we message people and call them and send them LinkedIn messages, right? And emails. And then you have all the, all the um, sales campaign tools and all of that. So um, I think the problem we also need to solve soon is how do we align all of that so that the customer still has a great experience because they don't get those in a product notifications and then at the same time they get an email from sales and then maybe a marketing newsletter because all those systems aren't talking and they aren't in sync um so that's the the other problem we need to solve for i think we need a specific tool or maybe a set of tools to to solve it yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense and and uh honestly thinking about about all the companies that we've been talking with over at Correlated too. I mean, I think you're right in the same uh, wheelhouse with a bunch of other companies who, you know, are struggling to get, one of the things you touched on was like that deep dive into an account or a specific user or a specific cohort within an, an organization and how, that, how they're using the product and how can we act on that data um, also kicking off some of those downstream workflows, but like you said, not hitting them in too many places at the same time. So that those are definitely some of the uh, the things that we're trying to uh, solve for a bunch of teams so for at Correlated. I think one other thing to, to touch on is this idea of, um, you know, change over time in data. So I think, you know, high touch and, and, and other player census and others in that market have helped to solve that pain point of not having any product usage data. So now we have some yeah. of that data, um, you know, in a CRM, but you know, not a perfect CRM for what we need anyways, but we have some of it, right? Um, and so it, it yeah. solved that initial pain point, but then you hit another one, which is, you know, one, the deep dive, like you mentioned, but another is that change over time. So how do we, how is that trending? We see a stamp of something that happened in time or multiple stamps <laughs> depend on how much custom building you've done. Um, but it's really difficult to see, you know, how has that um, product usage changed over the last week, over the last month? Um, are they inviting new users in? And, and it, it's just, it's hard to get that kind of full picture that you need, but it is a good step one. So, um, you know, we're appreciative of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally agree, right? I think the expectations of everybody just constantly go up, right? I think, um, again, and I look back at what we had like five years ago, I think we're in a much better, uh, right? The world is much better now. <laughs> um, but then in, in five years from now, um, it won't be enough, right? So I think the tools need to get better and then we will see, right, what tools get fully replaced and which tools survive. But I totally agree with you, right? This like change over time and then not just like seeing that, but also taking action and then 
taking action always can mean right there's something that gets triggered automatically and then there's something that gets done by a human right figuring out that and coordinating that i think is key because end users just hate it if they right get three different emails and they are not well coordinated it's just right it's outside of the product but it's still part of the product experience and part of your brand and so it really hurts you if you can't figure that piece out yeah yeah definitely it's been interesting to see how um you know our various customers are sort of like solving that and like basically tearing out how the that contact should be done so um Really cool stuff. I really appreciate the conversation. I think that we're coming up on our time here. Um, so thanks for sticking around for a couple extra minutes. And where should people go to learn more about you and to learn more about Amuda? Yeah, I mean, Amuda, that's quite quite simple, right? Just go to our website, immuda.com. Um, if you want to get in touch with me and chat about anything I mentioned, I think Twitter is best. Just DM me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is first last name. <laughs> um, so Ed Moritz Blesnik. Uh, I'm not sure if that helps if I if I say it out loud. So it's probably easier if you just copy paste my first and my last name. Uh, but then you will find me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks, thanks, Mo. I really appreciate you spending some time with us today, and it was great to have you on Product Led Revenue. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode of Product-Led Revenue. This show is brought to you by Correlated, the first platform built for product-led revenue. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow the Product-Led Revenue podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit getcorrelated.com slash podcast to get access to all of the latest episodes.